We'll now look at several different types of graphs, the first of which is a bar graph. So a bar graph will use either vertical or horizontal bars to represent frequency. The main difference between a bar graph and a histogram is in bar graphs we do have spaces between our bars, they're not contiguous like they are in a histogram. In addition, a histogram is used whenever we have a grouped frequency distribution, and bar graphs tend to be used for categorical data. Here we have an example where we interviewed several people and asked them what their favorite color was and got these results. So if we want to do a bar graph, the x-axis will contain these colors, which we'll abbreviate with a single letter, P for pink, B for blue, R for red, O for orange, and Y for yellow. And then the y-axis is frequency. So, whenever we're graphing these, pink was five, so we just go up to five and draw a bar. Blue was seven, so we go up to seven. Red was four. Orange was six. And then yellow was three. So here's our bar graph. You could have also done this with vertical, with a uh, horizontal bars as well. Um, it really doesn't matter. That's usually just personal preference. The next one we'll look at is called a Pareto chart, and these are very, very, very similar to bar graphs. So a Pareto chart is just a bar graph where we arrange our bars in order from highest to lowest. So we have the thing with the highest frequency first and then work our way down. Here's our example. So whenever we do this, so our x-axis will still be the colors, the y-axis is still the frequencies. So we start the exact same way we started with the bar graph. The only difference is the order of things on the x-axis. The thing with the highest frequency here was blue, so it needs to go first, which was seven. The next highest was orange at six. We then had pink at five. We had red at four. And then we had yellow at three. So this is a Pareto chart. We just arranged our bar so that the highest came first and the lowest came last. Next we have pie charts, or a pie graph, whichever way you want to call it. So a pie graph is a circle that we divide into wedges, and their size depends on the percentage of that category. So here's our data again. The first step is we need to figure out these percentages. We can add up these numbers and see that we had talked to 25 people. So 5 out of 25 is 20%. 7 would be 28%, 4 is 16%, 6 is 24%, and then 3 was 12%. So we need a circle, and it's usually easiest to start with the biggest pie slice, however, it really doesn't matter. The first one was 28, or the highest one was 28, so it needs to be just bigger than a fourth, and this was blue. The next biggest one was orange, which was once again 24, so just slightly less than a quarter. So there's orange. Next we had 20%, so that should be a fifth for pink. And then 16% and 12%. So the 16% should belong to red, and the 12 should belong to yellow. My pie graph here is definitely far from perfect, however, you can get the general idea. We'll now look at what's called a time series chart. A time series chart, indicated by its name, represents data that occurs over a period of time. So we're looking at how things change in time. We can often see these with things like weather or stock market graphs. When we graph these, we need to connect our data points with lines. Here's our example. This is a week that has passed and different temperatures during that week. So on the x-axis we have our different days. 
Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And then our y-axis will have the different temperatures. Here we'll have 90. And then down here we'll have 80. So here we have 81, 82, 83, 84, 85, 86, 87, 88, 89. And we indicate, we use this symbol right here to indicate that our y-axis does not start at zero. So we do have to indicate that we're starting our y-axis at something other than zero by basically just putting a little squiggly mark inside of it. On Monday, we had a temperature of 82. On Tuesday, it jumped down to 79, so now we'll connect those two. Wednesday was back up to 84. We'll mark 85, so it's a little more clear. Connect those with a line. Thursday was up to 90. Friday was down to 85. Saturday was at 80. And then Sunday was back up to 83. So this is our time series graph. Next, we'll look at dot plots. So dot plots are going to use lots of dots as indicated by their name. With a dot plot, we take every data point and plot it as a dot above the horizontal axis. Here's our example. This is a group of data points where we looked at the ages of different students in a classroom. So we only need a horizontal axis for this. Here our youngest was 18, our oldest is 24, so we just need to fill in this. So we have 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, and then 23 and 24. And then we use dots to indicate different data points. Our first one was 18, 19, 21. Since we have a second 18, it goes directly above there. We have a 20 another 19, a 24, another 20, another 18, and a 22. So this is our dot plot. Our final graph is called a stem and leaf plot. With a stem and leaf plot, we break our data into two parts. One part is the stem, the other part is the leaf. And I don't mean we're gonna take our different data set and break it into two separate groups. We're gonna break individual data points into stems and leaves. And this one can be confusing to explain without doing an example, so we'll just jump into the example to show you how it's done. Here's another one where we looked at different people's age. In particular, we just went inside of a store and asked people their age, and this is what we got. So with the stem and leaf plot, we have two columns, the stem and the leaf. The leaf tends to be the last digit of the number, and the stem is either the previous one, the tens place, or maybe it's the tens and the hundreds. It's the rest of the number. So for instance, 15 would be getting written as one is the stem, five is the leaf. 21 would be two is the stem, and one is the leaf. So now we've done these data points. If I jump down to this data point at the bottom that says 16, since we already have a one in the stem column, the leaf just gets added on as a six. The same thing with this 19. We do tend to like our leaves to be in numerical order. So when I'm dealing with the 20 leaf, I have a second 21, and then I have a 26, a 27, and a 29. We don't have any 30s, but however, we still, deal right a, we still write a three. We don't wanna skip stems. After that, we have a four, where we have a 41 and a 42. And you'll often see some kind of key that says something like one bar five is equal to 15. Just to show you that there's no decimals or anything involved in these, in this particular plot.